OPEX for public transport, funded by five million a year from council and five million by uh, Auckland Transport, and matching Waka Kotahi subsidies of ten million a year. Among the smaller changes are to uh, lock in the $2 million a year for CABs as proposed by the PACE committee and we are also funding not only that for three years but funding two other smaller projects, the Mungri Mountain Education Trust at just under 300000 a year and the Hibiscus Coast Youth Centre at 100000 a year allowing transition to alternative funding. All three of those proposals are supported by officials. So. Um, Madam Chair, I commend the budget to you and to all of our councillors here today. Uh, it has been a tough process. Uh, I doubt that any council has faced the loss of income that we have in the last year. We all know what could have been done with the money that suddenly wasn't available to us, but that was something outside of our control. I believe this is a budget that will do great things for our city and it will protect the key services and the investment in infrastructure the city needs. I believe also that it does find balance, and I believe that it will have broad support from the community. Thank you all once again for your work and your commitment in getting us to this point. Madam Chair. Thank you, Your Worship. Just so you understand how this will go, you're going to move your... Um, I, I will move formally and ask you to second, Madam Chair. second that. Um, we will do questions if there are any and then go to comments. The Mayor has a right of reply, and then um, we go to the vote. I'll just get the team to scroll slowly up, screen by screen, um, for you to see the amendments, which you will have on Nexus, if you can't see them on the screen. Right, any questions for the Mayor? Councillor Casey. Could the Mayor just talk about the scoping work on trees, please? It's been an issue in my ward. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Casey, for drawing that to my attention. Uh, I think that all of us um, have a concern that we are losing a lot of our notable trees uh, because they're on private property and uh, we don't have control in protecting, and we're not just protecting any tree, we're protecting we would like to protect what are notable and significant trees in our community. We have, of course, pushed the government hard on this. The reason that we have a problem was back in 2013, the changes to the Resource Management Act uh, stripped away protection for that tree, for those trees. Um, we have also looked at how, how we could schedule further trees, um, and that comes at a, at a cost. Um, but I think it's something that we have to examine and we have to examine all options of what more we can do. I've consequently um, included in the recommendations, just trying to find out where, uh, that over the next year we undertake a scoping exercise to examine how we can get the best value for money up on the screen now, if you can, you can read that, um, to make sure that whatever investment we put into this produces the best bang for the buck in ensuring uh, the survival of notable trees. What I'd like from the government is a, a definition based on age, uh, the nature of the tree, the girth of the tree, um, so that we could have a blanket coverage that meant that we didn't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars um, pushing to get just a handful of trees put on our schedule. Uh, I think this exercise will help us towards that end, and I think it's important that we do so. We, we are planting more trees. Equally, we need to preserve the best trees that we have at the moment because some of those trees take literally hundreds of years to grow. Supplementary, Madam Chair. Does that mean that after the scoping work, if there's budget implications, it will go into the annual plan next year? That is correct. Yeah, that's, that's what our intention is. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, question for the Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr Mayor, um, you did mention in your um, address just now around the business differential on the rating and how that's been affected by this recovery budget? Yeah, um, it was determined by council um, probably six or eight years ago before I um, was on the council that the differential for business rating uh, over uh, the, the cost the, the cost charged to businesses over residences could not be justified in terms of services provided. 
Um, it is, I think, a 30-year programme of bringing that uh, into balance, and we have not interfered with that process. So there will continue to be a diminishing differential that will lower uh, business rates in relation to residential rates to a point, I'm just trying to remember what it is, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, about 27%, I think, of the rates will come from businesses. Yeah. Right, thank you. Councillor Henderson. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, just in, in line with uh, concerns within specific wards, one of the, the concerns of my ward is A4. I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about the flexible approach to community facilities. Yeah, um, as I touched on in my introductory comments, uh, because there hasn't been 100% depreciation and because there hasn't been timely renewal of assets, we face a very large bill in relation to upgrading uh, our community facilities. Um, there's something like um, eight or 900 million that goes into this budget um, to deal with that problem, but it's still not enough. What we went out to consult on was a different way of managing uh, our community facilities. And there are variety, there's a range of different things that will be done. Um, the, the example that I typically use is the opening that I attended together with councillors Dalton and uh, Newman and the deputy mayor, the Takanini uh, Community Centre and Library. Beautiful facility. If we'd waited till we had the capital to build it, we'd probably still be waiting. So what we've done is leased a facility for 25 years. We still meet fit out costs of about $2.9 million. But the facilities are fantastic and they're available right now. Um, and I think that we're going to have to look at that as an option. We're going to have to look at um, how we can make facilities like the library at Westgate and the library at Takanini, um, multi-use facilities, so you don't have community facilities and a library, so you're getting better bang for the buck there. Um, we're going to have a look at uh, how we provide digital services, where there's a growing demand for digital services rather than um, services on the ground. All of those things will be worked through uh, over the next three years. We consulted on it, and 56% of the population uh, broadly agreed that this was the right uh, approach to take. The devil will be in the detail, and there'll be some hard decisions to make in the future, but we can't ignore the problem. It's real, it exists, and at the moment, we probably don't have the huge capital sum uh, needed uh, to just continue in the way that we were continuing. Right, thank you. Councillor Hills. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to speak to the main uh, point at the end as well. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the two questions I have, one, and I know I've asked it 14,000 times, is on the debt. And I just want for the to clarify, you know, my, my position is I think we should be driving as much home now, especially in the renewal space, because we have to do it at some point, and interest rates are the lowest they potentially will ever be. So I guess try and convince me again on, on why we shouldn't be having um, any more debt, and I kind of know the answers. Uh, and the other question is around, you didn't really expand as much as you probably could have on the, the climate and how we've come to the package, and maybe also where you pre kind of looking to go after this um, budget. Thank you. Um, in debt, uh, debt often looks like an easy way of dealing with your problems. Um, if we all felt that that was an easy way of doing, dealing with the problems, we'll prob we'd probably all enter personally into much more debt than we do. Um, the problem with debt, of course, is that it needs to be serviced. Interest rates are really low at the moment, but they won't stay that low. And when we buy facilities, uh, we construct assets with that debt, then there's the cost of operating that debt uh, and the uh, operating that facility and there's uh, the depreciation on it. So the costs of debt are very real. It is, however, um, justifiable to borrow, not to pay for your operating costs, but to pay for facilities that are long-lived facilities. So they'll last over uh, uh, over generations, you know, things like the Albany Pool that we opened last term, you know, really big facility, very expensive, um, but that'll be there and operating for 30, 40 years at least. And so it is responsible to borrow to meet your capital requirements. We work to the advice uh, that we get from credit rating agencies um, 
as to whether the level of debt we have is prudent. Uh, we negotiated with those credit rating agencies to determine that we could lift the debt to revenue ratio to 290%. Uh, we have not fully exercised that uh, borrowing power because we don't know what's around the corner. And if we fully exercise the 290% and then we were suddenly thrown into a lockdown and we faced another massive loss of income, we'd have nowhere to go. And I want to have that leeway. It's prudent to have that, that, um, that free board, if you like, if I use a slightly different analogy, to make sure that we can deal with future shocks that we might not have anticipated. On climate change, um, you'll be aware, because I've had discussions with you, um, that uh, while we've invested a significant amount into climate change, both in the previous long-term plan and more so in this budget, uh, it's not enough to do all the things that we want to do. Um, I would like to do more. The COVID-19 crisis has put off probably um, uh, taking some of the measures that, that could usefully have been spent in this area. When we tested it both on submissions and on Colmar Brunton, two to one, people believe that we should be doing more on climate change. And I believe that that needs to be at the top of our priorities when we address the annual budget uh, in the coming year. Um, a long-term budget is an important budget, um, but that gets tweaked uh, every year when we put together an annual budget. And if we do um, slightly better than, than probably what we originally anticipated, and I believe that we will, uh, I think we can make and need to make a bigger uh, investment in that and we would be consulting with the public in the next long uh, to the next annual budget uh, about the level of commitment they would like to see this city make. Um, we are not, of course, carrying climate change on our own. The major levers are held by central government, and we'll continue to work with central government on a whole lot of other things. In the meantime, the key things that we're doing are things like a compact urban design for our city, uh, mode change for our transport. Uh, those are the things that we can activate to deal with one of the most important areas of uh, uh, carbon emissions, which is our, our transport system. Uh, I do want to see how we're going to go with the incentivisation of the purchase of electric cars, and we'll be continuing to work closely with the government on that. That will make a major change. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Sayers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr Mayor, I just want to ask you a question around the Commonwealth Brunton poll that you mentioned in your in introduction there, and because uh, it certainly has been um, mentioned in a number of the press releases from your office. I was also interested in your comment around the, the margin that you saw in there, which is about 9% difference in support through that poll. Yet we also had the uh, public feedback that came back as well, which showed 19% of Aucklanders not favouring their proposal. So my question really is, what weighting does the Mayor put on that public feedback? And do we bother with public feedback if we're just going to use polls because they seem to be favourable um, for our proposals? We're certainly going to maintain our, uh, our consultation process and, and heed that consultation process. Uh, that's a statutory requirement on us, and it's also the right thing to do. But as you're aware, uh, that the loudest voices aren't the only voices. And I know um, the 19% you talk about uh, relies almost entirely on pro forma submissions, that is, submissions done in bulk. Um, by one particular organisation, which is the Ratepayers Alliance. Uh, they're entitled to do that, um, and uh, good luck to them. But we're, in, we're obliged to look at what the whole of our community thinks, not just the loudest voices in the community. If you took away the pro forma um, submissions, the submissions were reasonably balanced, 42-43. And again, that reflects the people that are more activist and um, who have taken the time to draw up a submission. Why we did Colmar Brunton was we wanted to know what the overall view across Auckland was, including all, um, all ages, all ethnicities, uh, both genders. Um, and the Colmar Brunton poll was conducted independently by an organisation that has a reputation uh, for doing it well. It was peer reviewed by Auckland University, and that showed the margin in favour of what our budget puts forward. 
And my responsibility, our responsibility, is to look at what the whole community believes and not just those that have uh, access to, um, uh, to the ability to lobby and to make their viewpoint clear. We don't ignore them, we take into account their viewpoint, but our decision in the end should reflect more on what the whole community believes rather than one section of the community. Uh, the, other, the other feedback, of course, we have is from our local boards, um, and our local boards, 21 of them, are pretty close to their communities, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's really important to note that 20 out of 21 of those local boards uh, decided that the measures that we are taking are the appropriate measures to take, uh, including, uh, uh, Councillor, your, your own local board. Uh, it came out in support of the measures that we are adopting, or I'm proposing that we should adopt today. Thank you. Any other further questions for the Mayor? Councillor Cooper? Just a question. Um, there was a, an article in the Herald this morning that says that we'd have an average 43% rates rise. Would you like to address that? Because I felt that was quite misleading. Um, you can make statistics show anything, and if you aggregate everything over 10 years, you can produce a figure like that. I'm not sure what the figure would be for Wellington if you aggregated theirs over 10 years, because they were proposing a 16% rate increase this year. Uh, Tauranga, I see in the, well, actually in the article it said 20. I thought it was a bit lower than that, 17. Uh, Hamilton, 8.9%. The truth is, while our city is growing the fastest and has the biggest needs, we're not increasing our rates the fastest. In fact, we'll be at the lower end of the rate increases right across uh, our, our country. Um, I just think, um, I don't want to spend too much time on, on that article, um, but I just think it, it didn't reflect certain things. Um, and it, among other things, said that we're voting for the water rate increase today. We're not, of course, because that's not within our power. Um, I could go through the article in detail, but I won't. Right, thank you. Uh, no further questions for the Mayor? I'll now move to comments. Councillor Hills, you've indicated already. Anybody else would like to speak? Deputy Mayor. Sorry, Deputy Mayor, Deputy Chief. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> never for me. Um, right, Councillor Hills. Sorry, I didn't think I'd be up straight away. I just want to uh, commend the, the budget. It's not perfect, but nothing in this um, place can possibly be perfect. I um, do want to acknowledge the, the climate actions in here. They are, as the Mayor said, probably nowhere near where we would all love the action to be, but this is a, a huge increase compared to other years. We did um, add some initiatives last year in the emergency budget, and those were sort of protected in the emergency budget um, after lockdown as well. So this 152 million uh, on top of the phenomenal amount of public transport infrastructure we are putting in, which is not included in that 152, um, is pretty significant. Uh, moving to zero emissions buses, I think in 2020, we were planning to continue to buy diesel buses until 2025, and until this year, um, this decision will mean we never buy a diesel bus again and we only buy zero emissions buses. Uh, we will be halving the number of diesel buses we have by flipping out um, over 600 buses into EV or hydrogen by 2030, which is pretty massive. And I'm sure that that goalpost will move forward again. There are climate initiatives working, um, and Māori-led initiatives working with all our marae, um, there are, we are doubling the number of recycling centres and resource recovery centres across um, the city. There's 11,000 more mature street trees coming. There is 200 hectares of native bush coming to our regional parks and over 200,000 seedlings um, in either our own nurseries or working with iwi and community partners on that. And that's on top of all the Mayor's million and a half trees, all the planting already being done by Healthy Waters Auckland Transport and our parks team already. So it's a pretty phenomenal, those are just some of the high level uh, things we're doing, but it, it will start to make significant change in our city on emissions and also preparing our coast through the CCMPs, our coastal compartment 
management plans and um, working with communities on the um, inevitable changes that our coast will see through to climate change. The other thing I just want to acknowledge is that despite COVID and despite the, the pressure we're under, when I was elected in 2016, we had a budget that was investing 18.6 billion over the 10 years in capital infrastructure, so transport, water, parks, and other assets. So in, in the, the four years I've been here, it's a 70, 70, 70% 70 increase in capital um, moving two budgets ahead, which is pretty phenomenal. We were, at the, in 2015, we were planning to do $8 billion worth of transport um, investment in capital. This budget, we're doing 12.6. At that point, we were planning to do $4.6 billion worth of capital expenditure on water, and now we are spending $11.1 billion on water infrastructure. So uh, in the park space, we were doing $2.4 billion worth of capital, um, and now we're doing 4.6. So despite the massive pressure we're under, we are doing what, what I feel like I got elected to do, was not to make the mistakes of the past, not to underinvest in our assets, not to have broken pipes and no public transport. It's to significantly increase investing in our in our city and communities that what people expect us to do and what what Auckland is and the rest of the country expect us to do is make sure we have the assets in working order and that we continue to plan for the future um, of younger people growing up in the city but also um, people who will continue to come here so I think there's there's something in this budget for everyone um, it is not uh, you know five percent is not easy on everyone but as as you've said uh, madam chair and mayor Goff the there are cities across the country putting up rates far higher than this, um, but I think we've kept this pretty reasonable by, while increasing investment significantly. So there, there's a lot to be happy about here, but there's a, a much more bigger job to do every annual plan after this and for the councils to come. But I think that's uh, pretty good. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Deputy Chair. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Chair. My, my pleasure. Uh, look, in many ways, I think the South EPN rate strike is, is kind of exactly like any other. Um, we have COVID, which has hit massively, climate change, which has and will make a huge impact. But ultimately, these conversations that we have with Aucklanders are all the same. Do you want more services or less services? Right? Because services have to be paid for. And to those that may not support this, I'd ask what services you'd cut. That, that's what I'd ask. I'd ask you to reflect on that. Um, there is a lot to like about this LTP, um, and just piggybacking on Councillor Hills here, we're increasing action on climate, we're providing a more focused approach to growth. That hopefully is going to result in a more modern approach to how we actually tackle the growth in the city in terms of transport, climate and the environment. We're furthering the great and important work on water quality in the Monaco and the Eastern Isthmus, which both desperately need work. Uh, the extra funds for public transport will be very welcome for the North West, and I want to thank you particularly for that, um, as well as the increased focus of this Council on economic development and local jobs. I have to briefly note my concern uh, around community facilities, um, simply because my Waitakere ward has submitted on this quite a lot. Um, and in my view, flexible approaches like this should be looked at in a forward way like Westgate and like Takanini, where we're looking at services that are desperately needed in, in, in um, communities that aren't having them, and how can we pro provide that flexibly? I think that's a good thing. Um, the concern that some in my ward have around backward-looking things, and I think we should just continue the conversation on that. I want to take that on faith and continue the conversation. Um, there's also more to be done. Um, obviously, a pool is needed for the northwest, something that we bring up a couple of times around here. Um, in my view, I think we need to ask Aucklanders in the future if they want a higher level of environmental protection and climate change. I think in future years we need to look at rates that give relief to people doing it tough, because we've got some feedback on that. People are doing it tough out there. We need to look at ways that we can help those people um, and actually shoulder the proper burdens of running the city on people that can afford more. It's easy for me to sit here, though, and say we need this thing and that thing, and every community will have a shopping list of things that are actually really needed. Um, but to that end, I want to wrap up by saying a huge thank you to the Mayor. I really do want to thank you for this. This budget is not an austerity budget. It provides great things for our city. It's within a budget envelope that people will broadly accept. They say leader of the opposition is the hardest job in politics. I don't think that's true. I think the mayor of Auckland is the hardest job in politics. Um, because you've had to synthesise the disparate views of councillors and of residents, 1.7 million of them, 
all have different views on how to run the city, all have different priorities. You've had to put that all into one pot and deliver us a soup that everybody can drink. And I think that um, you've done that. I think that you're, you're doing that while improving the city and its quality of life markedly as well. And I just really want to thank you for that. I think you've done a fantastic job. Subject to my reservations around the community facilities approach, I do commend this budget and I look forward to continuing all these conversations with Aucklanders. Thank you. Thank you very much, and a fine deputy you are too. Uh, Councillor Coon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, tēnā koe te koromatua o Tamaki Makaurau. Um, I would like to um, speak in support of the mayoral proposal and the 10-year budget. Um, I'd really like to acknowledge the consensus building approach that has been taken to putting together the budget, um, led by you, Chair Desley. Um, you've done a stellar job, and I've really appreciated the free and frank discussion that we've been able to have around the table. It's made me very proud to be part of this governing body. Um, I'd also like to just acknowledge the inclusion of the local boards and the leadership that they have shown. Um, it's been really um, a fantastic process in terms of everyone understanding the information that we've got and the economic outlook and all the factors that we need to take into account. Um, I've really appreciated that this, um, uh, this consultation round, we really tried much harder to listen to the broad voices across Tamaki Makoto and not just those who play the numbers game on submissions, um, who have traditionally submitted to a council that looks very much like them. Um, we've heard from a much greater depth of voices through this process, and you can see that just reading submissions from particularly from groups that represent um, across, across Auckland, and also from our, you know, I mentioned before about our advisory panels that just brought us a whole insight and a much deeper um, view into to their interests and their needs as commun different communities. Um, from reading the submissions, you really do get a sense of what is on um, people's mind, you know, through the emergency budget, it was very much the anxiety that's the concern about what was going to happen with the pandemic, um, and a lot of negativity um, directed at council um, about what we were spending, uh, spending funding, um, and you can really understand that anxiety. Coming through into this budget, what really came through strongly from just such an incredible range of um, submissions was that real understanding that we need to invest that we've got to invest in community, the environment, in arts and culture, infrastructure. And of course, this is where I always will have to acknowledge Wellington for making us look so good in terms of what happens when you don't invest and also when you don't plan for growth. And we just have to do that. Um, I was at a, a residence meeting a couple of weeks ago and a former mayor of Auckland stood up and said to everyone in, this, in the room that this council around the table, that we are drunk on arrogance and that we're sycophants because we keep putting the rates up. And I wasn't able to, at the time, say, excuse me, sir, but it was your council that didn't do that investment. Um, and that's why we still have got shit going into the harbour. Um, and so I really do commend this council and you, Mayor, for actually leading the way on the, the infrastructure investment that we've got to think about future generations and not play the Auckland game where we always make short-term um, decisions that don't look to the future. Um, also, of course, of a theme that comes through the feedback is that we should stick to our knitting, stick to core services. I always would love to know what those are, like when we're told we should just get back to basics and cut non-essential investment because so rarely do we actually read what those are. I haven't heard any suggestions come forward, and I think Councillor Henderson, you mentioned that as well. What is it that we are going to cut? I would love to know that. And I think about um, those submissions when we had that amazing presentation the other day from Action Education, this two women doing spoken word, and they have been able to grow and do some amazing things from investment from council. We're investing in them. And they showed us, we, they demonstrated to us the benefits of that. To me, that is core services, core funding. 
And I'm really proud that we do invest in future generations and in our younger um, community. Um, in terms of speaking and support, um, there's a lot of good things to highlight, and I'm glad Councillor Hills and Henson led the way in doing that. Um, a, a big frustration for me is that, yes, it's great that we have got this climate action um, budget, 150 million and some great investment, but we have got to do a fundamental reset. We can't have a budget that's siloed for climate action and say that we're doing something. We have to reprioritise. We have to do things differently as a council um, if we're really going to address climate change. Um, so that I look forward to that continued discussion. And I would just like to end in terms of a real positive that I don't think um, came out in the Mayor's um, when you went through your proposal, but is a real gem in the budget. Um, and that is about us removing library fees, um, fines. And um, a, a long-serving librarian said to me that if we get this through, this is where I do my teary bit, <laughs> is it will be the proudest moment of her career. And other councils have really like fought over this and grappled. And I just love the way that we just got presented with evidence. We heard the testament of one of our um, councillors around the impact of library fees, fines, and her growing up. And we all just went, this makes sense. So to me, that's, that is just such a, you know, we should really celebrate that that has come through this budget. So um, if I could end on that, and of course, add my round of thanks um, to the Mayor and to you, Chair, for leading it and everyone who's been involved in this process. Nā mihi, kia ora. Kia ora and thank you, Councillor. Councillor Filipina. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just uh, in regards to standing orders, five minutes and, and then possibly an extension. <laughs> if it's good. <laughs> so, thank you for that. <laughs> so, look, I'm not going to sort of... Um, look. Your Worship, and I'm not going to go through everybody else, but Your Worship, I just want to acknowledge you in regards to this mural proposal. My last comment is that I want to acknowledge the Mangadi or Tahuhu local board. Why? Because your 298,000 that you put in the mural proposal, 94,000 of that is the ABS from the local board. So I wanted to acknowledge the local board um, because they will also be continuing their ABS, 94,000, that's going towards the Mangadi Mountain Education Trust. And, um, Desley, my last mihis to you. Um, and, and, and again, for all that you've done. Kia ora. Kia ora. Oh, thank you. Councillor Cooper. I think that most of what I was going to say was um, ticked off by Councillor Henderson, so I won't repeat it. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Councillor. That, that must go down in history as being the uh, shortest endorsement of the mayoral proposal. Well done. That's a chocolate fish to you. Uh, Councillor Mulholland. Kia ora, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your time and your contribution on this. Um, as I also would like to take the opportunity to thank the Mayor. I'd like to be a voice for those people that don't support the mayoral proposal. I'd like to be a voice for those who are in Tamaki Makoto and in my ward who do have a view on what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. And I want to acknowledge those people have a right, they have a democratic right to have a view and opinion. And whilst I'd like to potentially meet face to face with those people so that I could share with them exactly how important it is to take the time and the opportunity to look at things seriously and allocate funding so we do have good infrastructure, so we are supporting the city and getting the growth that we need. But it's really important when I read through submissions, not only from my ward, but from others, and I see those strong views, that <laughs> we must accept that other people have a different view on many that I'm hearing right now. And whilst I agree with some of the principles, not, for example, the urban rating that we're proposing, um, but 
Um, you know, I do think there's a frustration out there of people not comprehending and fully seeing what is need and how we grow this city. I see also a lot of criticism of the people and others that are in our space, and those are the council officers. I see a lot of criticism about the people that work with us and for us. And I wonder why our community, our ratepayers and our residents have such a strong view. And I think we could do better, Your Worship, on sharing with those people who have a negative view on the things that we do need to do and how people need to be paid appropriately. And I've heard councillors mention their individual frustrations or issues that they've had, and I haven't spoken like this on, on this um, matter, not, not quite so strongly, but I am going to and continue to. It seems to me that sometimes we don't acknowledge those people who do not fully understand what we do and how we do and why we're expending this money. And I think we could actually take some time to communicate with those folks or to meet some of them or maybe hold some workshops for them. So whilst I um, support a majority of the mural proposal, um, one of the things that I uh, must say that I want to sincerely acknowledge is the work that we do put into community facilities. And um, yes, it is correct. Um, and I've heard councillors sound like actually the other ones putting up the proposal, but $31.8 billion, I think um, we have to keep this city moving. And so on behalf of the community that have input from the foe, people I represent, um, they are grateful and they are um, supportive of keeping the foe's proposed pool and rec centre in the LTP. So I am bound by that, as I am bound by those who do feedback. So I do um, acknowledge that there's been a lot of work go into this, it's correct, 150 hours, plus all the other hours that people don't see, and especially um, first term councillor, um, I, I think it's been an excellent process and it's good to see everyone has contributed, but I, I do want to acknowledge those who have strong views and opinions, not just the Alliance, say, for example, but other people in our community and my community who have written quite negatively on what we do as a governing body and what we represent and how we represent it. And I'd like to see that we can hopefully change the views of those people and see the good work that we are doing. So thank you, Worship, um, for the work that you've done on this. And um, I do acknowledge, and I should acknowledge, that um, for me it's important the faux pool and rec, because it does come down to your people in your area. And whilst there are many great things for Tamaki Makoto, it's nice to see something for the foe. And I also acknowledge the work that was done in one of our um, communities in Avondale that this council has continued to support. So those people that have negative views, maybe they could take a look in their own you know, backyard and see some of the good things that we are doing to support them. Uh, kia ora, thank you. Kia ora, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Dalton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, I'll be supporting um, the Mayor's proposal and I too would like to thank the Mayor because you've found the best balance that you can. It's, there's a lot of work in there and you've listened. You've listened many times and it's reflected all the way through. So thank you so much for that. Um, Councillor Simpson, Desley, uh, again, thank you for your leadership on this. Um, bringing Team Auckland together was significant and it has made a difference, so thank you. Um, I support all of the recommendations, but I, you know, I continue to have the reservations on the savings. And I, I'd just like to say, I, I don't know what they are exactly, none of us do exactly, but if they're going to impact on our staff, if, they're gonna, if it's going to be reducing staff, that everything is underpinned by the recommendations from the recent health and wellbeing review, that we make sure that we're taking care of our people, and that when we're looking towards a leaner organisation, that we're doing that through the right model of a leaner organisation and not just reducing staff, because that will work for this year. We need to be looking further out than this year. I'd like to emphasise again the importance of the quality of advice to the local boards as we change our model through the community investment model. That's critical. Um, we're going to be asking them to make some big decisions and we're going to be asking them to come to the table and think about the assets that have been sitting idle in their board areas for a couple of years, unused, and not likely to be reopened again. Um, they need some good advice, just uh, not on how they do that, 
but where it fits in the grand scheme of things within the whole Auckland plan. And as we bounce back and we move through recovery, if we see our cash flow returning and our dividends returning, the priorities I would like to see is holding depreciation at 100% once we hit it and also getting those local boards bulk funded. Because to have the most deprived local boards sitting in inequity for 12 years is simply unfair. And it needs to, it needs to be resolved within the next, I'd like to say, annual plan, but as we move through the next few years. Um, getting back to core services, uh, Councillor Coon mentioned core services and not knowing what they are. It's a conversation we're yet to have, and I'm looking forward to that conversation. And that's the work that, that, we're, that the CEO is doing for us to bring back to us because that's the opportunity for our organisation to become even leaner and smarter about we do, how we do things. And just finally, I'd like to say how much I fully uh, support and, and thank uh, the Mayor for the retention of $150 million for Māori outcomes. Uh, it's a budget that wasn't cut, one of the few might have been one of the only and um, we could and we should do more and we need to continue to take a for Māori by Māori we need to be doing more empowering around that space we saw how uh, iwi and Matawaka responded so well during COVID and have continued to and to continue to support that can only deliver good outcomes for our people so I'll leave it there uh, thank you thank you your worship Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Collins. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I just had to find the, uh, the mic button. Uh, just a few comments from me. I, I too will be supporting and endorsing the mayoral proposal. I just want to make a few quick comments around the process and offer my thanks again to you, uh, Chair Simpson and Deputy Chair Henderson, for a really robust process and being able to discuss uh, the budget, uh, the long-term plan. I found that many of the... Uh, workshops that we held were really robust. They were often testing conversations, but I felt really well informed by the officers. And so I just wanted to offer my thanks. And the mantra of Team Auckland has come across really well. And I just wanted to thank you, uh, Chair Simpson, for leading uh, both that mantra uh, and for modelling it as best possible. Uh, similar to Councillor Hills, I'm still rather challenged, perhaps unconvinced, around the borrowing levels to 290%. I welcome the Mayor's explanation this morning, again reiterating what we've been advised by officers to. One of the comments that's been said uh, a number of times is, we don't use the credit card to buy our groceries, and I fully accept that. But having said that and considered that, I wanted all of us in the room to remember what it's like for people in my community who have maxed out the credit card for their own families to buy groceries, to pay for phone bills, to clear their ability to pay rent. And whilst I don't think that is the approach for Auckland to be taking, I'm very mindful that many of the families that I represent alongside Councillor Philip Bainer are families who are doing that today. And so I just think it's an important consideration that we should be making. I'd also want to, I've, I want to acknowledge the Pacific panel. I have the honour of being the Councillor Liaison for the Pacific panel and here we are with a budget that's being re very challenged and yet the Pacific panel continue to show high ambition and be really daring and so I, I think it's important that we keep our eyes up given that we're in some really challenging financial times at the moment. I also want to acknowledge that we've seen uh, growth increase in engagement from groups who don't normally engage in these processes. And so it's been good to see more voice from Pacific communities, from more vulnerable communities, because it's important that their voices are heard. Uh, in Councillor Henderson's comments, he said that the hardest gig he believes in politics now is being Mayor of Auckland. Uh, and I was going to cheekily say to the Mayor that uh, you're a glutton for punishment, Mr Mayor, because you've now held uh, both the positions of Leader of the Office and Mayor of Auckland. I actually think the hardest uh, position in politics at the moment is 
uh, trying to become Prime Minister of Samoa, uh, in all honesty. But look, I just wanted to endorse uh, the mayoral proposal. I want to thank you, uh, Mayor Goff, because you have listened. Uh, you've taken on many of the concerns we've had. You've reached as balanced a position as possible. And I think you've shown a real open door approach to the way in which you've allowed people to be honest with you about the budget and to be honest about some of the concerns that I have moving forward. But I do want to say thank you, uh, commend the budget, uh, and I'm looking forward to the ongoing work of, uh, of how this budget's going to see Auckland thrive even as we come out of uh, a COVID time. So thank you very much, Chair. Kia ora, thank you for that. Councillor Sayers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll put two caps on, my regional cap and my, uh, my uh, ward cap as well, but I'll spend most of the time with the regional cap on. So yes, you know, a budget, it's actually the capex is 21% up on the last LTP. That, that's that from that 26 billion to the 31 billion. There's increased renewals. Um, I'm very pleased to hear, also see that going to Auckland Transport after they came and presented to us as well. Of course, we've got our, our general rate increases and perhaps other increases as well that we'll be discussing later this afternoon, including the uh, rural urban boundary rate changes. Um, I thought the um, consultation documentation that the council put out was excellent. It put out about the uh, fuel taxes, water rate increases, everything that compounds on top of the 5% as well. But when I put my Rodney uh, Ward hat on, I, I take a tight, tightly, slightly different tone, Madam Chair. The, the LTP this time round actually has less in it than last time. It still has the motorway extension, it still has the Matakana Link Road. But one of the big advocacy items for myself and the local board was always that unsealed road improvement program, and it's down 66%, even though the capex for Auckland's up 21%. So that's been reflected in the feedback we've got back from Rodney. Um, even the maintenance and renewal budgets for the unsealed network is down 22% down on maintenance and 20% down on the renewals. And of course, the, uh, the local boards tried to put, pull forward their ollie by lobbying to us um, because of this uh, idea of an urban. Um, boundary changes and another rate increase to try and get some equity there. So even with the 5% rate increase, Madam Chair, um, there are a lot of dead rats that Rodney is having to swallow, not just a couple. Um, I also believe the people of Auckland have spoken through the, um, through the public feedback and sent a very clear message, a, a message that I think elected uh, members of the Super City uh, are expected to uphold those democratic wishes. But I'm doubtful that will happen. No, we, um, the pro forma came in from churches, sports clubs, residents and ratepayers associations, associations, many organisations, and they all took the time, including everyone else that submitted, to read 600 pages of documentation that was available. We had uh, feedback sessions, we had uh, social media videos, we had face-to-face -face public meetings. There was a lot that was discussed about what's the difference between a 3.5% and a 5% rate increase. I think that was very clearly spelled out in the documentation and, and again, a good job done by the officers. Um, so that's when, the, the, you know, I don't agree with the comments around the Coleman Brunton poll, a poll, Brunton poll, you know, $110,000 and, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just worried that we're going to rely more on polls than we are on the public feedback, because the public feedback, there was only two questions in that poll, right? and the public feedback had a myriad of questions, and I was just, just outlined a lot of information to make informed choices, so I'll be putting a lot more weighting on that. So, yes, the people of Auckland have, have spoken. Uh, what's the alternatives? Well, as I've just said, everyone knew what the difference between the 35 and the 5% rate increase was. So the answer is already existing in the documents at, if we go to 3.5%. In fact, the feedback when you read it, that most people that didn't support the mayoral uh, proposal, perhaps when it came down to the budget, would support a 3.5% rate increase on some, some that wanted less. Um, it's also a bit of a tragedy as ward councillors. We can't actually gain the financial transparency to understand exactly everything that's being spent back into our wards. I don't know all the money that's been spent back into mine or the, or the other councillors' wards. So that makes it very difficult for any councillors to come up with alternative budgets. And I think that's something we should look at to try and correct in the future. Even if we have proportion regional spending across the different wards, I think that would be a helpful number for us to have and give more transparency. Now, sometimes I get, I feel a bit criticised, maybe, 
maybe almost bullied, but I won't use that word, around not supporting larger rate increases to deliver on the uh, outcomes and wishes of my constituency. But as I've explained, they're feeling very marginalised. In fact, so much so that 70% of Rodney have rejected the mayoral proposal. So my solution, Madam Chair, remains the same as I've said in every debate uh, in every, in every uh, working group that we've had, that cost reductions, we, uh, Council Dalton's correct, we collectively need to work out what our cost reduction should be. Not cost savings or efficiency gains, trying to do more with the same, but actually looking at what core business is. I know, I know some councillors don't want to have that discussion, but we need to have it. Um, professionally, I've always supported the Rodney Local Board's um, advocacy items. However, the residents of Rod or Rodney have rejected the mayoral proposal, as I said, by a massive 70%. You know, increasing rates, borrowing and selling assets is one way to fix a problem, but uh, making those deep cuts, looking at core business, defining what that is, what we need to do, uh, that requires tougher calls to be made. Um, the other, fi finally, Madam Chair, the other thing that probably came through in the feedback was still there's a lack of, um, I wind up now, a lack of confidence uh, and trust in the Auckland Council. And that may be reflective when people see the public results coming in compared to what we actually, um, weightings we put on that, they may well be um, contributing towards that. So my prediction going forward is that rates will still will need to increase further. Uh, they'll be through rates, uh, water charges and uh, fees. Uh, that's because of our increasing spending debt and failure to peel back to core business. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Look, I'm sure the Mayor will respond, but I'll just say I'm not aware of any Councillor that doesn't want to have the conversation around core Council business. I just don't think I've ever heard that being mentioned. Oh, I have, yeah. Okay. Councillor Stewart. <coughs> it's me. Well, I've, th I've thought long and hard about how I'm going to vote today, and I have decided not to vote for the 5%. I feel that I've been put under a lot of pressure to support the budget today. That because the way the Howick local board voted, that maybe I was told Howick doesn't deserve anything, and I take offence to that. The good people of Howick and Pakaranga, Botany, Flatbush, pay a lot of rates. The, member, the members here need to be reminded that if it hadn't been for the Manukau City Council, under the leadership of Sir Barry Curtis, we may not have had the airport shares, the dividends over the years that have been very well received by this council. And there's been a, a, number, a number of the um, other cities before the amalgamation had actually sold um, those, those airport shares and a lot of money that has come from those airport shares that were held on by Auckland Council of Manukau have been used by a number of the um, council wards around this table. To, uh, so to say that um, maybe how it should be punished, um, that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm not very happy with. So I'm going to support the people that I represent in the Howick ward, who in their submissions, they overwhelmingly were against the 5% rates increase in the Howick local board who voted not to support the rate rise. The 5% rate increase is only an average rate rise, and a large amount um, of our ratepayers will be paying a lot more of this, as was stated in the Herald this morning. We, we, we've also got to remember that um, our rates, we used to have it that the rates, the water rates used to be all included in, in with the council rates, so that, that's um, something that I think is, is also something that we have to consider. We've also, we've got the regional fuel tax, which Aucklanders are paying um, 11.5 cents a litre for this, and they'll continue doing this for some time. And uh, so people in my ward, how it, sometimes three or four people may be driving cars, and this could easily end up over $500 a year. I'd like to um, just say that I, I have complete confidence in our new CEO, Jim Stabback, that he's going to find some further efficiencies in the way that we spend our ratepayers' money. One of the things that we really have to do is we have to start, and I think this is something that uh, Councillor Sayers was um, touching on, we have to start doing things better, doing them right, doing them once, 
and um, to keep on fixing things is just not acceptable. And this is what's costing us very dearly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Watson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I think um, there might be a little bit of a, a northern theme emerge here, but I too, like uh, Councillor Sayers, would try and uh, retain a, a balance between regional responsibilities and and ward responsibilities. In my ward, which is actually fairly similar to a number of other wards across Auckland, if we look at the public consultation, the results were pretty emphatic. And I'm, re I'm referring to, to all the an analyses that, that come in with respect of the council consultation. I don't think it's appropriate to dismiss or diminish um, contributions after the fact. Unless you do it at the time, tell people that pro formas are, are not regarded in the same light. I don't think we can do that after the fact. But at any rate, in the hibiscus and bays, the support was 34%, 54% opposed. That was a 20% differential, virtually identical to the region-wide result. Upper Harbour, it was even more um, stark in terms of opposition, 32 support, 56 opposed. That was a 24% differential. This sort of opposition, however, though, was not just geographical. It was reflective of specific groups in particular the elderly and the poorer communities, for instance, where there is a real concern, a genuine concern, over their capacity to pay. In my view, there are obviously a number of factors at play in this opposition. Um, one is clearly the effects of COVID-19 with its associated uncertainty and economic hardship. A lot of people are under real strain, we know that, and not just the poor sections of our community. Many businesses and more affluent households are leveraged to the max, are under considerable financial pressure. For them, um, a 5.3% increase for the residential weight at a time of historic low inflation is an increase, uh, and an increase in what was originally signalled in the last LTP is not all that welcome. In addition to this, I think there's a growing awareness of the accumulation of costs that are being imposed on Aucklanders, and it sounds as if there was a, an article to that effect today. We have to mention water care, it is a CCO, 7% increase for the next two years, 9.5% for the six years after that. There is the regional fuel tax, we don't get much feedback on its um, impacts on our communities, but the Sapir group research in 2018 told us this was a regressive tax and it was inequitable in its impact. So we do have certain outer local boards in the north and the south uh, where that effect is marked. It can quite easily run up to six, seven hundred dollars per household. The targeted rate effects are, are, are minimal, but still feed into that perception. Another cost to a number of communities, not really uh, focused on today, is the sale of public assets, which in some areas is becoming increasingly resented. This year and the next couple will see the sale of over 450 million in assets. Uh, even in relatively limited areas like the Hibiscus Coast subdivision, for instance, that can result in tens of millions of dollars going out of the area with uh, little apparent uh, return. I don't know, I want to get into comparing the rate takes from the different wards, but if you look at there, there's some pretty salutary uh, comparisons that can be made. The Albany Ward, for instance, outside of the city centre, pays more rates than the rest of Auckland. In the northwest, it is a particularly disturbing picture from my point of view. Here, the average 16 to 29 per cent rate increases are being imposed for thousands of residents. Whether that's staggered or not, we don't know at this stage. They're being asked to pay for basic council services, which they don't actually have and which they will not have for the next decade and beyond. They're not in any LTP work programs. For me, this is an indefensible component of this budget and one which no amount of sophistic reasoning will, will explain away. There is an old saying, one half doesn't know how the other half lifts, and I think there is a little bit of a danger in this at the moment. It goes to the notion of accumulating costs for people at a time when they can least afford it, and to more localised impacts which are just plain unfair, um, where whole communities run the risk of becoming collateral damage. For those prone to dismissively equating such costs in terms of chai lattes or the like, um, a final word from the Sapere consultants. They said, quote, some of these households would likely think the additional cost in terms of school lunch is foregone rather than a cup of coffee. And I think that's a very real danger at the moment.
At this point, though, I do want to acknowledge those who have worked hard on the budget, and in particular the Mayor uh, and his ongoing commitment to the vulnerable in our society, the homeless people, those struggling on minimal wages, and our youth, who now more so than ever are under the stress of mental strain um, and all that goes with that. So I thank the Mayor from the bottom of my heart from that. Uh, but there are room for different views, and I would suggest now more than ever that we should be considering things differently. COVID-19 was meant to be a time to look at our futures differently, locally, nationally and internationally. As a council, we're over the prudent debt limit long held sacrosanct. In a little more than a decade, we've gone from 3.9 billion to, I'm just about finished, Madam Chair, to 10.1 billion today. There are only so many assets conveniently left by legacy councils that we can sell. Once they're gone, you're looking down the barrel of year-on-year -year rate increases of some magnitude. In short, the borrow, sell and rate model is not sustainable and certainly not in the way it has been used over the last decade. And to be fair, we did acknowledge that in the consultation where we said that even before COVID-19, responding to these pressures was going to be hard as we were reaching the limits of what we could responsibly borrow. Finally, Madam Chair, it was, uh, we seem to have a few political analogies here today, it was, but it was former Prime Minister David Lange who, in the midst of his own crisis, the disintegration of the fourth Labour government amidst a seemingly unchallengeable policy mindset of asset sales, privatisation and social services, commented on how difficult it was to challenge the bureaucratic and political mindset at the moment. He tried to get alternative advice. He couldn't. Uh, he went down and so did his government. So finally, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for your part in this. But I would just finish it up by saying that we do have different views. Uh, our communities are very different, and we should be able to represent those views, uh, fear of any uh, dispersions or, or any other types of criticism. I've tried to do that to the best of my ability, and I thank you for listening, um, because I know that's what our communities would expect. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor. point of order, um, Chair. Uh, just for the rest of the meeting, I want to withdraw Council's attention to 1.4.1 in our standing orders. Time limits can be extended by a majority vote of the members present, so we actually have to vote on it. Just so just to keep Councillor. that in mind. I didn't want to interrupt. Thank you. Yeah, thank just you. to that point of order, thank you for not interrupting Councillor Henderson. It has been a tradition in the past, uh, Madam Chair, where speakers are given a little bit more leeway when it when it comes to this uh, debate, and, and I'm happy to go along that with people whether they're for or against. Thank you. Councillor Newman. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and can I start by congratulating you for the work that you have done as Chair of Finance and Performance. You've done a very good job. It has not been easy. I want to echo the sentiments of colleagues who have um, acknowledged the, the Mayor and the uh, very difficult task that he has to balance up the very divergent um, expectations uh, right around the community of Tamaki Makoto, which of course is not a monolith that must be like herding cats with a harp some days. So I congratulate the Mayor for the, the challenge that he has taken on. Uh, and, and by and large, I, I support this. Um, I, I certainly am very, very pleased to see the increase in the in the CAPEX budget, obviously the very significant increase in renewals, that's been a real passion of mine. Um, I do have to um, foreshadow that um, in relation to uh, the recommendation A, Roman numeral 4, um, the uh, transition with respect to the new model for funding community services, I don't support that. I do need to have that vote recorded against, Chair. Um, and I do need to foreshadow that if it was up to me in relation to a Roman numeral seven, um, the water quality target rate extension, I would actually move to, to 5% in, in the out years as well, not three and a half, but don't need to record my vote against on that, but I would have done that if it had been me. Um, and I do want to acknowledge um, all of the comments that have been expressed around this table. I think that there have been some really um, useful contributions. I did read the Herald this morning. Um, I, I tend to try and avoid arguing with people who trade ink by the barrel, so I'm not going to make further comments on that. Uh, but what I will say is that the views that have been expressed around this table are views that are expressed by people who are very well paid. But the consequences of these decisions will be significantly paid for 
by people who earn far less than us. And to those people in my ward and to those Aucklanders who uh, will be disappointed with my vote for the uh, 5% rate increase, I simply say that I am sorry about that. I am sorry because that is a rate increase that is going to hurt some of my strongest supporters. Uh, but I judge that I have to do that. Um, I also, in my view, Chair, believe that you know, if we had gone higher, um, we would be in a better position to avoid something that I do think will continue to just tick, tick, tick away, and that is the risk that the infrastructure will not keep pace with growth and that we will face much, much higher rate increases in the near future as per what is happening in Wellington and elsewhere as infrastructure does not cope. Um, you know, there has been some discussion around what is the core role and function of local government. Well, to me, Chair, the core function of local government is to deliver on the expectation set down by Parliament because we are a creature of statute. Uh, and from there, we have to deliver the utility infrastructure, we have to deliver the parks and reserves and complement that with the delivery of the uh, community facilities which um, enable um, communities which are enjoyable, equitable, um, which meet the needs of both current residents but also enable um, growth within those communities for future residents. I mean, Councillor Coombe, you, you asked the question of we have to reprioritise, we have to do things differently. Um, my question would be, well, what? What does that mean? Uh, tell me the changes that will need to take place because in the communities that I represent, they need that core infrastructure to be delivered to accommodate not only the people that live there, but also the future residents that come in because we don't provide for that growth. It means that the existing infrastructure is going to be sweated even harder and it is struggling. Um, I do I'd really want to see us move to fully fund depreciation and to hold the line on that. That is the most important thing. Um, I do uh, really support improvements to water quality, um, but I, I just want to say this in relation to climate change, Your Worship. I'll end with a question. You, 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 you stated that um, you know uh, the public has given a tick to. Uh, to more money coming for new and expanded programs in the climate change space in year two, um, the next annual plan year. Um, I want to know is, is the Mayor similarly committed to moving to uh, address the equity deficits between communities starting in year two through the annual plan concurrent to new investment in climate change? Because to me that is the other thing that is outstanding. And we have had conversations about this, and it has been a slow burn. Yes, we're doing more in infrastructure. Yes, we're doing more in terms of renewals, but we're renewing to keep the existing level as opposed to improving those levels because we need to um, try and hold the cost down. Well, there's still the outstanding e issue around equity. Um, it has been foreshadowed, and I've, the Mayor has talked uh, at length about climate change, but I think that the Mayor hasn't addressed the question yet around when we address the equity deficits. Um, the final thing I'll say, Chair, and we'll have a debate in relation to um, um, item, item, a later item, uh, the rural rating. Um, I will be, uh, I want to foreshadow that I have concerns about that, and I'll be expressing that vote accordingly there. I accept that that's not um, an intrinsic part of this proposal from the Mayor. But I do agree with Councillor Mulholland that we have to acknowledge the views of those people who have expressed an opinion that we don't agree with and respect that, even when we find that irritating. Um, they are legitimate concerns, and some of us need to reflect our conscience and our, our, um, our values on those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Young. <laughs> Tēnā koutou uh, katoa. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's an honour to have uh, this opportunity today to make a final decision for our uh, 10 years recovery budget for all the Aucklanders. Uh, this has been my first long-term plan and the privilege to work with the Mayor, my fellow councillor, ISB, 
members, local board members, and the staff. We always hear in the media, in the public, how council wastes uh, waste the money and how it's not a transparent and uh, how there is no accountability. Last year, we showed this perception to be false through our emergency budget. Continuing our recall infrastructure investment and finding recall operation saving of $120 million. We will continue to hear this, regardless of whether we choosing a 3.5% rate increasing or one of 5% uh, increase. No doubt, there are many areas we can improve. However, I believe a political system in New Zealand is one of the most transparent in the world. While it is sometimes slow to deliver, our honest and the transparent political system is one of the reasons so many people want to live in New Zealand. The majority of those come to New Zealand choosing to stay and set up their lives and families in Auckland, including myself. This is because Auckland is the economic engine of the country. It's diverse. It's energetic, and I believe it is set the direction of the nation. It makes sense. But how can we support our region and these families? How can we keep growing? And how can we face the challenge for preparing of climate changing and reducing our emissions? None of us would like to raise rates. However, if we would look at the past 10 years, we have discovered that our plan and the investment has not met the demand from our huge growth in Oakland. The tools we have available as local government have not been enough. When setting our budgets, we need to find the balance between burden on ratepayers, maintains our service level and the infrastructure investment. This is challenging on a good days but the last couple of years has been particularly difficult for local government across the country due to the impact of the COVID-19. For the good of all Aucklanders, we cannot set our budget only thinking of our own political advantage. We need to think in the long term for the entire region as well as our own areas. And the no matter decision we make today, we still need to get better at telling our stories, engaging our communities, so that Aucklanders have a better understanding of our region, region's future and can be informed of those challenges we are facing now. This is true account accountability and the other difficulty for the local government. If even the majority are not engaging with us, what chance is there? for our less vocal migrant and the ethnic Aucklanders to be heard. Improving transport for the region, particularly in East Auckland, is still one of my biggest priorities. Provide, providing better way to connect Aucklanders with their families, friends, and the place of work, improves quality of life and make economic sense. I'm glad to see the progress of Eastern Busway, which once complete, will finally provide a reliable and convenient connection from the east to the wider transport network. The other key transport link for the east is the airport to Botany. The recovery budget with one of 5% rate increase will provide route protection for this project. I know how long this big transport project take to deliver and if we don't allocate the funding now, it can add years and years of delay. With limited community investment, this budget also manages to fund the new community center and the library in Ormiston, which is provide for the fast growing community of Flatbush, a project that has been discussed for years. Again, without a one of 5% rate increase, this most important community hub risks even further delay. This recovery budget does the best to keep making progress while facing revenue loss, debt limits, and the old infrastructure. 
it increased our region's investment in transport, housing, and the environment. It focused our spending on where it can most deliver for Aucklanders without putting too much pressure on our people. I look forward to how can we work together to build on this in years to come for all Aucklanders and for future generations. I will be supporting this budget, Kiora. And thank you once again for your leadership, Madam Chair and the Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Walker. Sure. Um, this, this budget obviously is different to most years because it's a 10-year budget. Um, I think that we are missing opportunities here to deal with some of our long-term structural problems. We know that uh, we're up to our debt limit, and we know that we need more financial support from government. I don't believe that we're, adequ that we're adequately informing ourselves and getting that support from, uh, from government and really explaining sufficiently our situation. We know that we've been running down now uh, our assets, that our development contributions are not sufficient to cover the cost of growth, and that currently we are still continuing to experience significant growth um, in Auckland. So my real concern is that over this um, 10 years, we're going to get into a progressively worse situation. Having said that, uh, there are some, uh, some things that have been good that have happened recently. The CCO review, the Council Controlled Organisation review, gave us some objective uh, advice. And the recent information that we've received from uh, Scottish Water around efficiencies that could occur across our water and wastewater uh, networks are very revealing. What is clear to me is that our team, and that includes our chief executive um, and others, need to look much more closely at efficiencies over the next um, 10 years. When I look around Auckland and I talk with people, they certainly bring to me observations around how we could be doing things much more efficiently. They see things. It is incredibly difficult for members of the public and for councillors to, to have actually adequate oversight of this budget because you actually can't drill down into it. You can't um, arrive at cost and revenue centres. You can't uh, get any appreciation of how to drive uh, efficiencies. We very much have to rely on the information that we're given and where councillors like myself have asked for a, a breakdown and on, a, on an ongoing basis around uh, large assets to get a handle on whether those assets are being employed uh, effectively. That could be something like the Aotea Centre or stadiums or transport assets. You just can't get that information. You can't arrive at that um, efficiency. So I'm certainly of the view that we can do better than what we are doing. I don't know what the budget is going forward in this uh, long-term plan for all the strategies that we don't have around our lack of an investment strategy, a property um, strategy, a water strategy we're finally working on. It took a crisis to um, bring that about. That's not a great style of management. We don't have a stadium strategy. We don't have a civic um, strategy. Uh, we're pulling together an economic um, strategy, and that's great. But there is a dearth of oversight on the part of ourselves over the council-controlled organisations that we're meant to have some control and issue some direction around, and paint me, we're not doing that adequately enough. I would suggest also, as councillors, we need more oversight over our operation. And if the CCO review is anything to go by, then I would suggest that there are significant opportunities there. So I've got a, a real concern embarking on another um, 10 years when it is clear that there are a number of things that we continue to not address. I ad agree with Councillor Newman around this new community services uh, model. I, I don't um, think that we've considered that adequately enough, certainly from an investment um, perspective. We're making the assumption that the private sector is going to be able to build things and will 
uh, lease them and, and so on, and that will be a more economical model. I don't know that that is necessarily the case. And like Councillor Watson, I'm particularly concerned that we continue to sell off assets without investment strategies and, um, and other strategies to inform us. And as I mentioned earlier, structurally we're in a problem and we don't have too much more to, um, to draw on. So I have a, a real concern voting for a, a long-term plan that I have adequate um, confidence in, and I still do not have that um, uh, confidence. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Darby. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Mayor, acknowledge your work in this. Um, it's not easy, and we don't always agree as we uh, traverse the, the long journey to get here. Um, and I haven't agreed, uh, in part, in large, I have, but um, I'll be supporting uh, this proposal. Um, and I do acknowledge, uh, Chair, your, your active part in this. It's, it is a big task. And all the councillors and um, Member Taipiri, uh, your Independent Māori Statutory Board contribution all the way through as well. Um, look, probably at the outset, I, I'd probably just like to suggest that we, we don't compare ourselves with other cities and their, and their rate increases. Um, you know, we're the only international city in New Zealand, and um, they have not the diverse revenue base that we have. They're very rates dependent, just about every other city. Um, look, that's just a, 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 um, a, a brief comment I'd want to make. But look, this budget has been enormously challenging, in some ways more challenging than the emergency budget. And a lot of progress has been made here, um, but there is a long way to go, and I probably want to reflect less on what we've achieved over these 150 hours of workshops, more on the challenges ahead, because this budget I see as an entree uh, to some big, bold moves we're going to have to make going forward. Um, and of course, top of the list is tackling climate change, not scratching at climate change, and we, we are... Uh, making inroads there, but uh, let's be honest, we're still just scratching at the surface on climate change. Housing an enormous number of homeless Aucklanders, overcrowded Aucklanders, um, people living in buses, cars, vans, etc., uh, remains top of the agenda. And uh, getting Aucklanders to move efficiently remains there as well. And um, Right in the mix is, of course, reversing the, the, the enormous uh, degradation of our environment. So there's good wins here, and it's a good platform, but there's a long way to go. I'm particularly pleased to see the debt levels pushed out up to that 290 range, um, and I've uh, put my oar in that area with you, Mayor and, uh, and Chair, and we've had some online Zoom discussions with uh, Treasury, after I wrote to Treasury, I also wrote to the Governor of the Reserve Bank, and I, I really acknowledged both the Governor of the Reserve Bank and Treasury for you know, having that discussion with our team, but particularly Treasury, uh, and just testing our own good internal advice, and we've managed to push that out and be assured that it is still in the safe zone, and we're not going to be hurting our ratings. <coughs> Um, and I'm not going to be unkind in this budget, but I'm, I'm probably just going to highlight a few areas which I think require some further work, uh, things that I've raised in the past, and I know people have got cross with me for raising these, but I'll raise them again. I'm just, it's not about personality here, it's about issues, and, and, um, and I'll be um, pretty consistent in that areas. One, one fundamental gap for me is the lack of the development of a strategic response to COVID. You've heard me say that again. Uh, we're 14 months on, we've known about COVID and we talk about recovery. I'm much more interested in the reset and what you can, uh, the, the leap that you can take out of COVID, particularly when you're steering at climate uh, colliding with it. But I've spoken of that in the past. Um, look, it's my failure that we haven't got traction on that. I needed to convince you more strongly. Uh, but there is some more recent progress uh, happening with Auckland Unlimited who are engaging with COI2 uh, at the Auckland University, that's the Centre for Informed Futures, and we'll be seeing some work uh, come on that front uh, in the coming months. The second and third bodies of work we've left on the table, and it's about $4 billion, and there's uh, no appetite at this time, but I think there will be some in the future. We didn't uh, have much in 
political inquiry on this area at all. And of course, we, um, we, we, we stop the public from hearing on this. And that's uh, the, the $2 billion of airport shares that we've left on the table and $2, uh, $2 billion of uh, our interest in ports of Auckland, at least. Um, some progress has come out of those um, recommendations, though, and the chief executive will be bringing us a paper. For the very first time, we're going to see a paper on what a strategic asset actually is and what it means to the council. We, we've never, ever done that, Chair, and uh, thank you for your work in that and getting that work up. Um, and I think that will be a bit of an eye-opener as to what we, um, what we own there and why we own it. I do note that aviation is, has an enormous climate footprint, and our investment in aviation is starting to look very 1980s. Uh, there's progress on the port front, too. Um, not much appetite for engaging there, but uh, I think it will come. The Minister of Transport's uh, instructed a national freight strategy, and that's the next stage to underpin port relocation and the, and the ownership stakes that we might have in that. So um, we, are, we are going to have to make some big and very brave moves in the next year, uh, probably in our national policy statement response in the transport area um, and, and on climate and housing. Um, I'm, I'm still smiling at this stage, uh, even though I haven't got everything over the line and the discussion is not fully engaged, but I'm lending my vote of support to this budget. It is deserving, but there's a long way to go. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd like to add my name to the list of people acknowledging the work that you have done here, and you, Mr Mayor, as well. Thank you for the proposal. Um, no budget's ever perfect. But I would encourage councillors to think back to what things were like prior to 2010. Some of you came from legacy councils, some didn't. Things have changed dramatically. You know, there was talk forever about a rail loop. Well, that actually is now tunnelling. There was the old Winyard Quarter and the old bus depot. that was pretty sad, sick and not flash. The Winyard Quarter was dirty and unclean. Um, and unloved. I did an interview for directors for um, Auckland Unlimited the other day, and one of the, one of the interviewees had come back from 10 years in the UK. And his words were, I could not believe the transformation. It is going to be one of the most stunning cities in the world. Are we perfect? No. But we are on a good trajectory. My water, Franklin, didn't account for depreciation had the worst drinking water for an urban area in New Zealand, had inadequate wastewater treatment, could not afford to keep the road maintenance budgets up, and could not afford to allocate funding for growth. That was replicated virtually in every area of the city. The, the central old Eglex Auckland City Council didn't do anything about stormwater overflows in the old pipes. Um, there was not enough future-proofing in Waitakere or in Manukau. Papakura was just too small to survive. Rodney just could not get its road sealed. Well, we've got these 700 odd Ks now. It needs to be done. They all had inadequate wastewater treatment, and according to the modern age, with the exception perhaps of Waitakere and Manukau. We have a far better trajectory. We have a long term plan. We have a long term budget system for transport called ATAP. We have record amounts of public transport growth. Councillor Darby talked about the future. He's absolutely right. The reflection on the past gives us an indication of how good our future can be if we stride out towards it. Um, my personal view is that having property taxation as a mean of funding local government is well past its use by date. I've said that before. We need to have a far better way. ATAP leads the way with transportation. We just have to have the, the Crown come with guaranteed 10 years funding. Perhaps we need an AHAP as well an Auckland Housing Alignment Program to line up the strategic asset delivery that's required to have fast-track housing. And we certainly need to have a better economic alignment with Wellington about how we grow our new age economy and what that looks like. Mr Mayor, you're talking about climate change endeavours with the next annual plan. Be cautionary, not because I'm not supporting climate change initiatives, but because the industry sector and the real rural sector are already spending millions of dollars with their industries 
on climate change initiatives and to add another taxation to them on their, top of their already strident efforts would be, in my opinion, unfair and unjust. But that's a discussion for next year. In the meantime, Madam Chair, we are moving in a good direction. We need to accelerate it if we can, and we need to accommodate better for growth in the future, and we need to get our policies, as Councillor Walker says, aligned up with those strategic plans to deliver it. So thank you for the work. Um, this budget is a really good step in continuum in the direction which we're heading, has my support. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Right, with no further speakers, I'm going to speak now, and then after I have spoken, I'll ask the Mayor for his right of reply. So we've heard already that today's budgetary decisions are really a continuation of our emergency budget, and certainly not a business as usual or just the normal type of LTP we've had in, as part of Auckland Council in the past. We had thought we were down a billion. The good news is we're not. It's three quarters of a billion, but it's still a huge shortfall. And there are lots of unknowns, lots of zeros, as the Deputy Mayor has just interjected, um, and it's going to be a very lot unknown road ahead of us. So despite everything that's happened in the COVID space, we still need to continue our investment into the region to ensure we actually do recover. If we stop investment and just keep our libraries open and pick up the rubbish, we will not be able to deal with infrastructure challenges, we will not be able to renew our ageing assets, or not, be a, no, not able to deliver to meet population growth. And the impacts of not doing those things will take Auckland backwards. I want to just reflect on how we've got here, because we've whipped through the first two items, because we know, but nobody else does. The Mayor completed his draft proposal pretty much the night before it was presented to this committee. He did so because he listened to every comment from everyone around this table, including the CCOs, IMSB and local boards. He did that to ensure that the draft budget that went to Aucklanders reflected the views of Team Auckland. It wasn't a left versus right budget. I say that, we all know what side I sit on, we all know what side the Mayor sits on, but as per usual, from last year and this year, politics has been put, put aside and we have worked collectively to put the future of Auckland first. What we now have only includes a few amendments of that original proposal. Having heard from Aucklanders, and again discussing with Team Auckland, and I acknowledge that through these discussions, one of the biggest issues for most of us to consider was the one-off 5% rates rise. We now know that while it was higher than what was projected in the last LTP, it happens to be one of the lowest proposed rates increases in New Zealand. Councils that have managed to go for a lower rates option represent much smaller communities, the likes of Clutha, Tasman and South Taranaki. Given the total of all three populations is still less than the population of Manarewa, I think we are doing pretty well and delivering value for money. So why the one-off 5%? Timing around the expenditure of the CRL and the Central Interceptor, our two mammoth infrastructure investment projects, couldn't have come at a worse time for us. That large investment associated with those projects has landed at the same time as the need for us to respond to the challenges of COVID-19. So does the one-off 5% mean ratepayers are a group are contributing more than the usual 40% of our total revenue, noting that we lost 60% of our revenue from other sources and 40%? That's, those are the figures that we have used. The answer to that is no. In fact, prior to our emergency budget, the percentage of revenue from ratepayers was 36%. This year, in our emergency budget, it went up to 39%. And in year one of our LTP, it's back down to 38%. Why? Because we are continuously looking for other ways to attract revenue and are committed to doing so. We do not expect the ratepayer to fill the 60% gap. So why the extra 900 million of additional investment? 
enabled by that one off 5%. On top of what's already been said, we know collectively that our assets historically have not been managed as well as they could have been. This LTP addresses that with a 50% additional investment in asset renewals compared to the previous LTP. It's important to note the size of our assets, 50 billion worth. We need to look after them, maintain them, and replace them when needed. There is no point in continuously looking to build new stuff if you don't look after what you already have. To build or replace our assets, we need to borrow, which is one of the reasons we needed to temporarily adjust our debt to revenue ratio. Our emergency budget was an instant re reaction in, or a response to a crisis. But we now know that COVID-19 wasn't or isn't a short-term thing. In fact, all our advice to date tells us it's going to be at least three years long. So we needed to adjust, adjust our approach. We did the responsible thing and discussed our position with rating agencies who have indicated to us they are satisfied with our financial budget as outlined. It is responsible. You will remember that Audit New Zealand have also sat in on every one of our workshops. Moving away from that agreed approach has a risk of a rating downgrade, which would be about $15 million a year in, in extra in interest payments, equivalent to almost a 1% rates increase, and quite frankly, we can't afford that. If I was honest, the thing that bothers me most in this budget is our asset sales targets. We are currently nowhere near our emergency budget target of 244 million. In fact, we're only sitting at 60 million. And whilst we need to be pragmatic and prepared to do things differently, we must ensure that what we sell is absolutely not needed and continue to ask for the evidence to support that. We can't be wedded to assets just because they are physical representatives, re representations of our presence in communities. However, we must be absolutely certain that in selling something that we currently own is in the best interests of Aucklanders. I think it's important to acknowledge what we're doing internally to assist us in the financially challenging time. I congratulate Jim, Peter, and all of your staff in finding the 120 million with months to go before year end. Our LTP locks in 90 million of ongoing savings for the 10 years. It's actually 100 million, actually, if you take the extra 5 million from Auckland Unlimited and 5 million from Auckland Transport. This is the second highest savings target ever achieved by Auckland Council after our emergency budget. And to give it context, that's more than the total rates take from Henderson Massey or Devonport Takapuna local boards this year. The total rate take from those two boards. These cost reductions will bring continuing pressure on our organisation. So whilst our CEO has confirmed that these savings will not impact our service levels, we also need to carefully monitor for and respond appropriately to other impacts. This wouldn't be my budget speech without acknowledging the impact of the water quality targeted rate increase and extension. So my thanks to the Mayor for accepting my amendment I raised to his draft proposal and to you all for accepting unanimously that amendment and it went out to our communities. We know the result of that consultation feedback and we have a clear mandate to do both. Both, And that means we can de deliver additional investment to every local board as well as bringing forward major infrastructure projects by six years in the, in the Manukau Harbour and of course the Eastern Isthmus. Long overdue upgrades to the wastewater and stormwater networks in the Western Isthmus are on track to stop regular wastewater spills into Oakley Creek, Viola Motions Creek and Cox's Creeks by 2028 and deliver step changes in soilability to the beaches from Point Chevalier to St Mary's Bay, thanks to the water quality targeted rate and the central interceptor. However, the wastewater and stormwater networks around Hobson Bay date from the same era and suffer the same issues. The old issues of combined drainage networks and under capacity infrastructure. As a consequence, the streams of Hobson Bay routinely test up to 200 times above public health gui guidelines for E. coli. 
and currently swimming isn't advised. This is unacceptable just when we have spent millions of dollars improving access to that same bit of water. I am beyond excited that the increase of that water quality targeted rate means that we can start work to remediate this uh, next year and not stagnate and remain health compromised with health warnings around that bay for another six years. Finally, I'd like to thank you all for your respect and listening to all views over the 150 hours. I'd like to thank our CCOs, our local boards, IMSB and all our Auckland communities for their input. Once again, Team Auckland worked well together during this process and I'm pleased about that. My sincere thanks to you, Peter, and your team for their patience when the same question gets asked multiple times. Your professional advice and guidance during the some 150 hours of deliberation with this committee, not to mention multiple more hours with myself. I'd also like to um, give my thanks to our governance support. I think there have been more than 150 cups of tea. Um, and I also want to make special mention of Tamsin, my CSA, for your support as well. Is it perfect? No, nothing is. We don't know what the future will hold, but in my personal opinion, backed by our Treasury and Finance team, this budget is fiscally prudent enough to ensure that if we stay safe, we will recover well, and if we don't, we can weather that storm too. As a seconder, I commend this LTP recovery budget 2021-31 to the vote, and I thank the Mayor for his Team Auckland approach to his final proposal. Thank you. I now ask Mayor Goff for your formal response. Um, first of all, thank you to everybody who's contributed to the debate, and extra thank you to those that uh, showed the forbearance not to contribute or not to contribute at length because the points had already been made. Um, look, we are a diverse group around this table. Uh, but equally, we're members of Team Auckland. And um, it's, it's probably true that in our party political support, Desley and I don't, don't agree um, at all on that issue. Um, but we and others around this table, and there are strong members of uh, different parties around this table, have put aside those differences to say, what is the best thing we can do for our city of Auckland? How can we work together to achieve what can be achieved? And how do we come up with a responsible plan to deliver? And, you know, I'm really proud that we have worked in that way. And, you know, I'm probably taking Councillor Darby's advice, I won't talk about all the other councillors and the problems they might be facing, but you're aware of that. We have worked collectively. We've indicated our differences, we've accepted those differences as reflecting uh, honest uh, differences and approaches, but we've tried to get the best we can for our city. And that's something that I think the uh, people of Auckland expect of us and that we have delivered. Um, I pick up uh, Councillor Newman's comment about it must be like herding cats, the diverse nature of the Auckland communities. And we are incredibly diverse. You know, the difference uh, between, say, the community of Councillor Philippina and the difference between the chair of the Finance Committee, uh, Councillor Simpson, they, they're hugely different. But they are all equally Aucklanders, and we need to take account of their needs. And I acknowledge the point made by by Councillor Newman, that we do have to tackle part of the heritage the, from the legacy councils of unequal uh, allocation of facilities across the region. Uh, Councillor Newman's chair of that body, and we're all going to have to work really hard to see how we can achieve equity um, without um, severely punishing some sections of the community that were uh, that, that inherited uh, an abundance of facilities. I acknowledge that um, people have had different views. I, I have not pressured any councillor, um, and probably referring to a comment by Councillor Stewart, uh, I have not pressured any councillor as to how you should vote on this, uh, this issue. Um, we've all heard the facts. Uh, we've all had the chance to, to ask questions. Every question that's been asked has been answered. And I rely on the competence and the integrity of everybody to be able to make up their own mind about how they're going to vote. Um, but I, I do want to make this point. Um, listening to one councillor, um, and they made the points quite sincerely, but they didn't want to sell any assets. 
They didn't want to borrow any more money and they didn't want to increase rates. Um, if we don't do any of those things, where does that leave us? Uh, I think, you know, every one of us needs to consider that if not this, what would you put up to keep the services running, to keep the investment in infrastructure, not to overburden the folk that pay their rates to us, uh, but to allow the city to move forward? And if you don't have an alternative, then it's kind of a little bit the easy way out to oppose what's put up without putting up an alternative. And I think everybody, every one of us, has got to think uh, about our obligations in that regard. Just touching quickly, and I, I can't go through every comment that everybody's made, but I've made extensive notes on it. Um, and just the acknowledgement um, uh, Councillor Hill's made in the opening comment that uh, this represents a 70% increase in capital investment over two, uh, two terms. Uh, that is a phenomenal increase that we are still increasing by 21% in this long-term plan, the budget, when we're burdened with the effects of COVID-19, is a huge achievement. And, and, I, and I, I want to acknowledge everyone around the table and the local boards and the staff who have worked together to say, which, what's the right balance of the levers to pull so that we give a fair go to our constituents, but we make progress for our city? And that's always going to be the task, and I think we've addressed it in this budget. Climate change, um, look, there are, it, it, is a, it is a huge challenge. Let's briefly celebrate the progress that we've made. When Bloomberg flew me to Paris a couple of years ago, I was one of a group of 13 mayors in the C40 that agreed that we would phase out all carbon emitting public transport by 2025. We were the leading 13 in the world. Now we're doing it in 2021. That is something to celebrate. And you know, the rest of the world has moved, is, has moved on w uh, equally with us uh, in that regard. Are we doing enough to stop the, uh, the increase in global warming to head off catastrophic impacts uh, for, um, for uh, our environment and for our economy and for agriculture? And the answer is no, we're, we're not doing enough yet. Um, I'm not saying that the city uh, is carrying the major part of that burden. That, that has to fall on, uh, on, on, on government that has 93% of the public revenue raised in this country. But we need to do more, and we owe that to future generations to do more. And we would have been doing more, but for COVID. And 2022 in the annual plan is the opportunity when we can step up our actions. And that won't be easy because there's a lot of competing needs in that area. Water quality, um, uh, I think Councillor Henderson raised. And uh, what we didn't expect uh, before this year, uh, before the last year, I should say, was to increase uh, our, our commitment to investing in water supply by nearly a quarter of a billion dollars. We found out the hard way that in the third dry year in a row, we needed greater water resilience. And we've provided that. And we won't run out of water in this country, uh, in, this, in this city. But we are having to invest hugely in it. We know that uh, on the other side, the wastewater treatment, we know that we, you know, the huge advances in the Mangere uh, sewage treatment plant, uh, you know, from somebody that grew up in, uh, in, in, in that area, uh, are enormous. But we, we know that we've got to stop putting wastewater into our harbour anywhere in the city. And that, that is a huge task, and I absolutely endorse um, Councillor Simpson's uh, views on the water quality targeted rate going up, as did the two-thirds of the people that replied both to the Hayland poll and to the submissions that they put down. Um, I acknowledge the comment made first by, by Councillor Coombe and by others about the consensus building approach, and I think it has served us well. You know, it won't be a perfect budget, but nobody can say that we've just bounced into this and, and made decisions without considering all of the options and all of the implications of taking each of those options. I think we have done that in a competent and professional way, and we have been well served by our staff in doing that. Um, uh, look, I acknowledge, and, and Councillor Mulholland made the point about um, people out in the community. Uh, there'll always be people that have a contrary view. Um, I've, I've, 
you know, uh, at various times been elected to different positions, and if I get 50% of the vote, I think I've done really, really well. And most governments uh, over our history have probably got 35% of the vote or 40%. There will always be other views. We should respect those views and the right of people to hold them and to promote them. And in the end, we still have to do what we believe ourselves is the right thing to do on the basis that we are probably better informed about the decisions we're making than, in, than anyone outside the council, because we spend hours and hours considering it. But yes, we won't get 100%, but that doesn't mean to say that we don't strive to listen to what people's concerns are and to address them uh, as we can. Um, I just want to touch on a, a couple of things. Uh, Councillor Sayers, and uh, beginning there. Look, uh, I appreciate the concerns in the Rodney Ward, um, but I think people, as the Deputy Mayor has said, have to consider um, where the concerns come from. And at both bookends of the city, in Franklin, where the Deputy Mayor and I live, and Rodney, where you live, we had councils that did not fully depreciate their funds. We had councillors that did not um, provide decent water supplies. Rodney and, uh, and Franklin were the worst supplies in the region, and the water supply in your region has gone down by 50% in cost and the quality has gone up by 100%. And I think that needs to be recognised by, by folk that live there. And, you've got to, and, and one difference between Rodney and Franklin was that Franklin had a targeted rate to seal roads and most of the roads were sealed. And we inherited 95% of the unsealed roads that came from the Rodney ward. I want to see those roads sealed, but on a 5% we can make some progress. On a 3.5%, we can't. Zero. That's the advice that we have from, uh, from officers. Um, to Councillor Stewart, and, and listen to your concerns as well, um, you and I attended the opening of the new Ormiston Town Centre, and Councillor Young pointed out quite well, we're going to be investing pretty soon $25 million, uh, in the new community uh, centre and the library in that area. That will give you one of the most modern, uh, and, and best community centres and libraries in the area. We're spending $1.3 billion on the Eastern Busway, and that's only the first leg of it. Uh, Pakaranga, uh, Pamua to Pakaranga, and then we'll go on to Botany. That runs into billions of dollars, and I'm not sure how the people of Howick uh, can say that we should provide those things but not have a revenue source that enables us to do that. You know, there's a huge... and, and and to be fair to East Auckland, they were underserved in public transport, dramatically underserved in the past. But we are addressing that. And Councillor Young's been a strong advocate for that. And I thank you for that. Um, likewise, Councillor Watson, um, you know, listen carefully to what you said. But there are a couple of things. We've had to give away a whole lot of things that we couldn't do because of COVID. But what are the things that we kept up? We kept up the investment in the Orewa uh, seawall. Uh, we've kept up the investment in the Scotts Point Sports Park, two major areas of infrastructure that we're delivering um, in your area. And, and you know, it's, it's not fair to say, well, we want those things, but we're not going to pay for them. And, you know, I won't mention the Hibiscus Coast Youth Centre. It's a small amount of money. You and I have had long discussions about that, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we're making the investment in it. But if we are to do these things... You cannot have expenditure without revenue to support it. And if, if we don't get this revenue, and this, if the 5% didn't go through, there's a whole range of things that we wouldn't be doing. I want to um, probably finally um, just celebrate, um, and I think Councillor Darby did this, we've got a hell of a lot that we've still got to do. We won't run out of challenges on this council. There'll always be things, more things that we want to do than we, we can afford to do. But I'm just thinking of a few of the things that I've visited around the region. And I'd start with the CRL because we've just marked so many milestones. It is 4.3 billion and we're paying half of that. But, you know, we've started work on the Aotea station. We've started work on the, uh, the Karangahapi Road station. We've started work uh, at the, the Mount Eden end of it. We've, we're... You can just see it outside our own office buildings. The progress that we're making day after day, which will have huge impacts for the city. I went out with um, two of my South Auckland colleagues to the Awakiri wetlands. And I've said it before, but if you haven't been out there, have a look at that as a 
perfect example of how we deal with dealing with floodwaters and restoring a natural environment and making it a place of beauty for the community. And equally, um, if I look to Councillor Casey in the Oawanga uh, area, um, the Oakley Creek area, well, for years I represented that area and it was uh, kaikui of grass and a couple of scrubby exotic trees and a concrete drain. And now it's a beautiful natural wetland area with playgrounds, with people using it all the time. There are fantastic things that we're doing. Go downtown and have a look at uh, Te Komiti Tanga and have a look at the progress that we're making on Te Wananga, the, the harbour park next to the ferry building, and the way that Key Street is looking. I had dinner down there the other day, and the restaurant owner came up and said, um, he's the guy that owns Rod and Gun and the next restaurant next to it, this is just fantastic. This is really transforming our city. And we're doing so many of these things around the city uh, that, that, you know, there is nothing to be ashamed of in the efforts that we're making. Look at the progress of the Northern Busway, and it's still, you know, I, I went uh, there with the, the local councillors as well, and, and you just see the progress being made day after day, the Eastern Busway. Um, yeah, we've been hit by COVID, and suddenly we lose 25 uh, million passenger trips a year that were happening on public transport, but we will get them back, and that will be part of a transformation of a city that will be world-class. And, and we are all working towards that end. So I think I've, I think I've said enough. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the end of a long process. I thank everybody for their forbearance. Um, uh, I thank those of you that uh, can support this budget. I think it's the right thing to do. Like all political moves, it involves compromise and it involves uh, prioritisation. But that's the world we live in. We don't live in a dream world where these things can be done, but they'd somehow never have to be paid for. This is a, a, a realistic budget. It does do the right thing. It does move to the transformation of our city. And it does actually cope with the biggest crisis we have faced in our revenue with COVID-19. And it comes through with a solid answer to that crisis and a solid path forward. I commend it to all of you. Thank you very much. Kia ora. Thank you, Mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, 150 hours, a lot of debate, a lot of smiles. It's been moved and seconded. I'll put it to the vote. All those in oh, favour say... Sorry, just, just sorry, Madam Chair, just a, just a point of order. And I, I don't mean to interrupt. I'm just wondering if you're just going to be handling this in the normal way where people record their opposition against any part of the budget. The only um, person I have heard recording a vote against a clause was Councillor Newman. Well... Yeah. OK, so well, a... I'll, I'll, I'm another person then. What would you like to... So, so I'll record uh, my vote against uh, um, A1D. The 5%. Yeah, the same, Madam Chair. Councillor Watson, Councillor Sayers, Councillor Stewart, Councillor Walker against A, I, capital D, the 5%. Yes, uh, yes Councillor? Record my um, vote against A... Roman numeral four and I V. Sorry, I'm just catching one B. Is that the um, community services? That's community services, and B is the asset recycling target. Right. Got that. Can I ask a point of clarification, Madam Chair? Um, I respect the right of councillors to recall their vote against that, but this is a package, so if you don't support the 5%, then presumably you're not supporting what the package, 5% package represents. So shouldn't it be either a vote against the package of 5% or um, an alternative? It doesn't, it's kind of counterintuitive to separate that out. Well, speaking to the point of order, Chair, I mean, it's a, it's a matter of debate, not a point of order, um, that Councillor Akima is raising. But, I mean, she's inviting debate on this. Some of us, well, I have to speak from my own position. One of the reasons why I'm voting against A Roman numeral 4 is that the information contained doesn't actually demonstrate how that will be funded. Um, if Councillor Akima has the answer, that's great. I don't, which is why I'm voting against it. But that's not a point of order. I think that it's, no, it's either up or down. I think it's more around AI, which is ABCD, which is the whole yeah. levered package.
that's more the debate. Just a minute, please. Give me uh, a couple of minutes. Just if I can speak to the point of order. Look, the way that we've done this in the past, generally people find a lot of things they want to support in the budget, but there are some things that they're against. And we've normally allowed people to do as they've just done to record their vote against. And I'm happy to proceed in that way. It's worked in the past for us, and I think we should do it in the same way this time. All right. It's your proposal. I support that as well. So I have um, those... No a four. No more? Right, let's start this again. It's moved by the Mayor, seconded by myself. All those in favour say aye. 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 Against? Abstentions? Carried. Thank you very much. On that happy note, I think we'll break for lunch. Thank you. <laughs>